Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, good morning, everybody. No roaring lions uh, this morning, so... Uh, hopefully you'll still uh, be awake. Uh, yeah, so this is John Merck with uh, Guy Barwell, Daniel Martin, Elizabeth Oswald, uh, and uh, myself, and we're all from the University of Bristol. Um, so let's, uh, let's first start to deconstruct the title a little bit. So this is about authenticated encryption. So I think you will all realize that this is a key component in uh, secure communication. And we're going to look at it from a provable security angle. So uh, what we're trying to do is, is to bootstrap security of a complex primitive, because authenticated encryption is not uh, at the lowest level, uh, from a more simple primitive, for instance, a block cipher or a super function. Um, what we're interested in is to do this in the face of uh, leakage. So there's two types of leakage we will consider, protocol leakage and side channel leakage. So protocol leakage happens uh, when the implementation of constructions aren't perfect for whatever reason and you start leaking little things like different error messages or uh, unverified plain text. Um, that differs a little bit from side channel leakage where you really leak directly on the primitive. So, um, you can think about uh, differential power analysis or cache timing attacks. Yeah. So the good news is that if you take secure primitives and you take provable security, you get secure constructions, for instance. For instance, there are many papers that talk about this, so you might not be able to see uh, quite what the titles are, but trust me, there are many papers here um, that do this. Now, once you add the real world into the mix, then suddenly your constructions are no longer secure. And again, there are many papers here to uh, display it. So, uh, so this is uh, Serge, for instance. This is, this is you. Uh, uh, and uh, some other papers as well. Uh, other ones are harder to read. So uh, this is uh, not good. This is quite ugly. So you can try to get rid of the real world. Um, I mean, we're in the I track, which I think is for the, the, the ideal world track uh, based on uh, Europe precedent. But maybe we don't want to get rid of the real world and we want to be able to do something uh, for the real world. So then it becomes rather ugly, uh, moral wise, but it is what it is. So what can we do? Uh, so we need better models. So, the questions uh, that we then want to address are threefold. So, one is how to argue about uh, AEs, so authenticated encryption's robustness in the face of leakage. <coughs> the second one is uh, when do these primitives uh, compose securely, so when the primitives are secure, when do they compose against leakage uh, securely as well? So, ideally, you want to say if my primitives is secure against leakage and then I compose it into a construction that I know is supposed to be secure, then the whole thing is still secure uh, when considering leakage. And, um, then the next question is, how resilient can your primitives actually be against leakage? So uh, I'm going to warn you that this is a rather theoretical construction, so not something you actually might actually want to do in the real world. Yeah, so uh, from the contributions, uh, we'll provide a definite framework to deal with the top one. Uh, we will give the confirmation of uh, what I call the root folklore, uh, even though it's not that old, the uh, release of our plain text, that uh, the NRS schemes, uh, they behave as you would expect them, so if you release a verified plain text, you're insecure, if you don't, you're fine. And uh, we also formally prove that uh, cipher feedback mode uh, is resilient as well against um, leakage. And, the main reason we, we chose CFP is because it relies on PRS and it was relatively easy to analyze. You should be able to also uh, work with other uh, schemes. And then finally, uh, we provide a strongly adaptive leakage resilient pseudo-random function. And yes, we do throw the kitchen sink at it. Uh, it's in the generic group and random oracle model. So uh, that's why I say you might not want to do this necessarily in practice. But this is, uh, as a proof of concept, it, it tells you that it's possible and it is um, relatively efficient, I would say. Good, so this is then uh, the outline of uh, the talk. So we'll look a little bit first at 
what's known about modern authenticating encryption, just uh, to give a, a set, uh, to set the setting. Then we'll look at the new uh, leakage scenarios, so the protocol <laughs> leakage, primitive leakage, and also how the composition under leakage works. And then uh, there's the leakage resilient PRF uh, and the conclusion. So, so authenticated encryption, um, we are using this quite common syntax where authenticated encryption, the encryption takes a key, a nonce associated data and a message and it outputs a ciphertext. Uh, there's no real point in uh, splitting out a tag here, so the tag is, is kind of integrated into the ciphertext. Uh, of course, if you have a construction, you can have an explicit tag. But from a definitional perspective, there's no need to. And then decryption, uh, key, nodes, associated data, ciphertext, and it outputs either the message or uh, a symbol that the ciphertext was not in the, well, not valid. There's the usual three nice behavior assumptions, so correctness, if you encrypt then decrypt you get the message, tidiness, if you decrypt and it props up the message and then you re-encrypt the message you get back the ciphertext that you fed into it, and then length regularity means that uh, the length of the ciphertext only depends on the length of the message and not on anything else. Yeah. So the standard security notion for authentic encryption is uh, conveyed in this picture, which is a uh, security notion due to Robert and Shrimpton from 2006. So you have an adversary, and the adversary has to distinguish between two worlds. In world one, he has the real encryption and the real decryption oracle, and in uh, the other world, he has uh, something that produces random midstrings of the appropriate length, or uh, if you look for the encryption, uh, for decryption, he just rejects everything. Now, of course, to make this notion meaningful, you have to Make sure that there are some restrictions. For instance, if you ask for an encryption and then feed it back in here, uh, you, you want to prohibit this or, or deal with it in a way, because otherwise they're, they're trivial to distinguish. But those are details that uh, you can look up in the paper, that paper, our paper, many papers. But the idea is here. So this notion is known to be equivalent to having both indistinguishable under chosen plaintext text plus ciphertext integrity. So it's really neat because it captures these two different notions, confidentiality and authenticity, in one uh, overarching notion. So when you look at it um, in more detail, you see that this encryption oracle is really an encryption where you feed the nonce and associated data and a message. So the question is, what are the restrictions on these nonces associated data and message? And then it turns out that, uh, so there's no restrictions on the associated data and the message, but there are restrictions on the nonce, and there's a well-known um, hierarchy of three levels. Uh, if it's random, then it's really an initial vector. So this is what uh, people used to do to analyze, for instance, CVC mode. If it's unique, then it's a nonce. So this is, for instance, something that uh, breaks counter mode. And then uh, if you have no restrictions, so you can repeat the nonce, uh, then we talk about misuse resistance. So these abbreviations, uh, I think they are also due to the they're due to non-prime for roadway and strip, I believe. Uh, don't hold me to that. So this is the strongest, so this is where we would like to be, but often we, end, we start with things there. So the question is how do you go down and can you do so even if, you have, uh, if things are starting to leak? So this is where generic composition comes into play. So there's three different types of goals you might want to uh, consider. Um, so the first goal is domain extension, so you have a PRF that takes a fixed or a PRP that takes a fixed input, but then you want to go to something that has a variable input length. So this is uh, CBC does this for you or CFB indeed. Uh, you might want to boost security. So I said there were these three levels. So you might want to go from the top level of the, the weakest level IV based security to the strongest notion where you can reuse nonces. So uh, randomize then encrypt is a, a way to do this. 
And finally, there's compositional security. So this is related to what I mentioned before, that you have confidentiality and you have integrity, and that together gives you authenticated encryption. So uh, encrypt that Mac, Mac that encrypt, and encrypt a Mac, they all offer you this sort of uh, uh, composition. So there's several schemes uh, that do this for you, and uh, they've been analyzed in a non-setting by an improper program in Shrimpton. So this is scheme N2, so it encrypts and then it creates a tag. This is a scheme that takes a PRF and an IV scheme and builds it into a nonce-based scheme. And then you can mix them up. And then you get uh, the scheme is called A5, so you have a PRF, an IV-based scheme, and a message authentication code, and then you get uh, a nice scheme. So the question now is, how secure is this scheme or this scheme when uh, things start to leak? Yeah. So what I've mentioned so far is all due to uh, a sequence of papers, and there's an NRS uh, I should have mentioned there as well. Um, and then when you move to leakage, people have looked at it, uh, but they've really concentrated on decryption leakage and a very specific type of decryption leakage as well. So, uh, Goldi Reva has all, they looked at the special case where there are multiple decryption errors, where, uh, which occurs in certain contexts. Then, uh, I keep thinking, um, on the Reva et al, they uh, looked at the release of unverified playtext. So this is a situation where you um, need to uh, effectively decrypt uh, part of the ciphertext to get a message, so you can then feed the message into a tag, into a tag verification algorithm. So you might actually uh, release the plain tag before you have verified it. Then Hong uh, et al. they looked at a special case based on encode and encrypt. And uh, finally, uh, Barbell et al. they looked at any type of deterministic leakage on invalid ciphertext. But it's still quite restricted, and it doesn't really deal with probabilistic leakage or leakage of encryptions. Um, so uh, we'll look at that in a moment, but first, uh, the release of unverified plaintext. So as I mentioned, what you have here is uh, scheme 81, and if you want to decrypt this, you'll have to go up, and you'll have to go up here before you can do the verification of the tag, to recompute. And it, at this point, you might end up leaking M. So this is uh, release of M and verify plain text. Uh, hmm. So with the deterministic leakage, it looks like this. So you have a, an additional leakage oracle that outputs your leakage, uh, but only if this one rejects. And if this one doesn't reject, then that one effectively uh, rejects. So. So the things that are not being considered is, for instance, if this leaks, or if the tag might leak when, when you start recomputing, or all sorts of other things might leak. So uh, the, the block ciphers, for instance, could leak, because uh, they're the smallest building block, and they might still leak uh, all sorts of internal variables. For instance, noisy hemming rate of S-boxes is uh, very common uh, in the side channel community. To look at, uh, there's other things that can leak as well, and they can leak directly on the key. It is not clear uh, what the effect of this is going to be. So there's a challenge. Um, so how does this primitive leakage affect the overall uh, construction in a security setting, and how can you model and argue about the leakage? So what helps to, to, to look at this is to re deconstruct the Roger Shrimpton definition. So they only have two oracles, uh, encryption and decryption, uh, but really there should be four. So there's two oracles, encryption and decryption, that specify the goal. So there you have either decryption, decryption, or real or random, and uh, the true encryption and decryption oracles. Uh, so these were implicitly usurped by goal oracles, because you can simulate them using these, but it, uh, 
is much easier if you have them around and then uh, you can add them, use them for the leakage. So uh, the way this looks uh, is like this. So what you have is you have here always true encryption oracles and here you have the challenge one, so it's either this or this. And then we assume that only these leak. So we're not allowing leakage on the challenge oracles because uh, that's quite difficult to define. Nonetheless, I should point out that there is a scenario where leaking on challenge oracles does make sense if you look at um, secret sharing based multi-party computation because in that scenario you might want to open certain values uh, even during uh, the challenge encryption. So <coughs> with this model in place you can start reanalyzing all the NRS schemes and the first thing you have to do is of course you have to define how to relate the leakage classes because what you want to say is that if this is secure against leakage, this is secure against leakage, and this is secure against leakage, and then the whole thing is secure against leakage, but uh, leakage is now, uh, the security definition is with respect to a class of leakage function. So you have to define how these leakage classes def uh, depend on each other because you can't suddenly start leaking more. Uh, and leakage will be kind of independent, so the leakage of the whole construction is a concatenation, so to speak, of the leakage of the individual component, and you assume that there is a certain independence there. And what you then see is that from the eight schemes that Don Premper et al. Uh, identified as secure, uh, A1, A2, up to A4, A5, and A6, and A7, and A8, uh, there's only two, A5 and A6, that cope well with leakage. And these are precisely the ones uh, where you have encrypted the MAC, so you can actually verify before you need to decrypt. As soon as you need to decrypt before you can verify, then uh, you have release of a verified plain text uh, attacks and you can't have security in a decent leakage setting either. So A5 and A6. And this is a problem because only A4 is known to be uh, secure against misuse resistance. So these notions, they are secure, but only if you uh, keep the nonsense unique. As soon as you start repeating nonsense, you need to go to A4. So now we're in a situation where none of the known schemes is actually secure against misuse resistance in the presence of leakage. So to solve this, we have a new mode, which is called CIVET. CIVET? Well, if anybody comes up with a better name how to pronounce it, uh, do let me know. Um, so what we do is we combine here uh, the various IDs, and we have a PRF, then we have the IV, and then finally we have the extra tag. So we have to pay a price for this additional security because um, the expansion is going to be two elements uh, out of a PRF rather than the usual one element out of a PRF. But the good news is that it is now secure if the underlying primitives uh, are secure. And that also means that the MAC verification doesn't start uh, to leak the true tag. So you can't, for the MAC verification, you can't do a recompute the tag and check with the tag that is given because then uh, very trivial attacks arise. So uh, you have to be a little bit careful how to do this. And the other thing is that you need a PRF that is strongly adaptive secure uh, against uh, leakage. And this is something that is difficult to achieve. So why is this? Well, let's look at PRF security. So again, we have two oracles around. The challenge oracle, which either outputs a PRF or a randomness, and the real PRF function that also provides you with leakage. And only this one leaks, so this one doesn't. And again, security is going to be relative to a class of leakage functions, and this allows us then to model a split state uh, leakage, assuming uh, only computations leaks the information. Because uh, what you want to do is you want to use something like masking, where you split the state and then 
uh, you're going to assume that you can't leak on both shares of uh, the secret at the same time. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, okay. I didn't know it. That's my noise. Oh, well. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, so the main challenge is to get strong adaptivity. And with strong adaptivity, what you want is that if somebody asks here uh, for the output of a PRF and, and gets the output of a PRF or a completely random string and then starts to ask for leakage here, you uh, or ask for making this query where it leaks, you still want to have it secure. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, work in a model where the adversary can specify uh, the leakage function. So this leakage function then might depend on um, the input outputs and especially the outputs that you've seen here. <coughs> so more specifically, the type of leakage we want to consider is uh, leakage functions that are only restricted in uh, the output length to uh, prevent leaking the full input. Because if you can uh, leak all inputs completely, then you can't get any security. So you need to do something there. Uh, and then repeating invocation results in more and more and more leakage. So it kind of accumulates. So uh, there are some caveats. So for instance, this model allows future leakage, which is always a bit peculiar, but this is uh, what leakage resilience does. Um, and the model also allows for inefficient leakage functions. So it's a very strong model. Uh, but it has some aspects that are uh, not realistic and uh, it's also weak in the sense that uh, this is very restricted in the length of the output whereas if you'd actually take uh, um, a real device and, and plug an oscilloscope to it it will not give you only a few bits, it will give you uh, gigabits, gigabytes, megabytes um, but still it's a, it's a useful model um, so if you look at how a PRF with a split state model works, it looks roughly like this. So you have your key that is split now into two parts. You have an update function here, which is also has two parts. And you have the actual evaluation here, which is also in two parts. So um, what you do is, in the first stage, you update and you evaluate, and you might leak on this. And in the second stage, you update you take, uh, you evaluate the second part and you leak again. Now, there is a wonderful construction by uh, Kiltz and Pietrzak where they explore pairings to make everything uh, neatly fit together. So if you think about this function, fk of x is the uh, pairing evaluated in the secret key and the hash of the input, then that's a, a wonderful PRF and it's very easy to evaluated in a split state model, uh, namely like this. So you update your secret key by, by adding the randomness and then you here subtract it, so then the sum of these two will be the same, namely k. Uh, here you do the pairing, you get a z, and then you multiply in this thing and then you will see that, that you will get exactly the uh, pairing of si, this one plus that one of h of x. So that's easy, and then you think like, wow, this is great, this is brilliant. Why isn't this secure? And the problem is that you can do kind of <coughs> side leakage. So imagine that x star, y star is your challenge. So uh, this is what you receive uh, from your oracle. Then you ask for the leakage to be <coughs> on evaluations on those side channel points. And you can actually sort of do a leak in the middle attack. And uh, these values will coincide. So as soon as you can leak just a few bits, you can check whether they indeed coincide. So the solution to this problem is to use three shares instead of two and uh, then you can leak lambda bits which uh, should be about uh, half of the uh, root size. So thank you for your attention. Okay, and uh, let's not speak again. Okay.